Oh boy, I can't wait to play the new Indiana Jones game. Huh? Hang on a minute, Billy. For modern games, you'll need modern hardware with ray tracing. Ray tracing? What's that, Mr. Murdoch? <laughs> Why, it's quite an old technology, but now done in real time thanks to powerful accelerators in your GPU. That sounds expensive. <laughs> It is very expensive! But you don't want your games to look ugly, do you? Ugly? <laughs> like you? Well, I guess not. But I don't have enough money for a new GPU. What can I do? It's easy. You just need to find a sponsor. Like our sponsor! Server part deals. Save big on refurbished, recertified, and even new hard drives delivered straight to your door with free two-day US shipping. Use our link and enter code LTT5OFF to get $5 off any order. Yep, it's true. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle is the first game that was developed from the ground up to use ray tracing. Not as an option to make the lighting a bit more realistic, but as a core, required component of the game. So, we've set up two test systems. One using the latest and greatest at the time of filming, NVIDIA's RTX 4090. And one using NVIDIA's entry point into Ray Trace Lighting Splendor, the 2060. We're at 15 frames. That being said, on both PCs, we've set everything to max. On the 4090 side, we're still 4K native. We have everything turned on except for path tracing. There's still a lot of ray tracing that's happening, like the reflections you can see in the window. Big thing I've noticed is that even in ray trace games, there's still just visual anomalies, like his hair kind of changing color. We are consistently above 60 frames a second, which is far above what I expected in this scenario. But there is one thing NVIDIA really bunged up, and that's the messaging. We call RTX ray tracing, but in truth, most games even this one, only switch to global ray trace illumination if you turn on path tracing. I'm very impressed with the 4090's ability to do over 60 frames a second, and I've had to verify the settings many, many times to make sure that I'm not secretly using DLSS. But that's gonna tell you nothing about how the starter point for ray tracing is gonna do, the 2060. And immediately you'll notice that the 2060 has a bit of challenge giving us the performance we'd like to see. And so why don't we turn down some settings and give this thing a chance. One thing to note is that Indiana Jones does a VRAM test when it boots. If you have 12 or less gigs of VRAM, it's just gonna set it to the lowest settings. If you use a custom EXE, you can actually boot the game and skip that VRAM check uh, to get access to those settings. But uh, unfortunately, if you try and turn them on, the game will crash. Actually, we're gonna leave 4K. We're gonna turn on some DLSS, baby. 23 frames a second, this is incredible. Even with an internal resolution of 1080p, we are still hovering around 20 frames a second. What if you have a 2060 and you wanna make it actually run? Let's turn down some settings. This game is running on the 2060 at a native 1080p high settings, and it looks drastically worse, which is no surprise. But this is still a ray trace experience. If you bought your card six years ago, you would still be able to play these games in fairly high fidelity. Oh, those reflections are bad. Oh, remember when there was bright light reflecting on the floor from that window? David remembers. Now it's clear that the 2060's first generation RT cores were not chosen wisely in terms of future proofing, but as you can see, you don't need full ray trace global illumination for a game to look really impressive. And it could be argued that Nvidia's big selling point for this generation somewhat came true, even if Linus wasn't wrong that you'd be better off waiting for a second, third, or fourth, or fifth gen card. But why are we switching in-game lighting to ray tracing? More importantly, why are we doing it now? It's been used in film for decades, and long before it was a selling feature on the side of GPU boxes, even video games were using it to create the pre-baked lighting maps used in traditional rendering. We'll get to that, but first, you may already know the difference between path tracing and rasterization, but let's lay them out just in case. Rasterization is the process of converting vector graphics, or polygons and their intersecting points, into a raster image, which consists of pixels. Shaders are then applied that best approximate what those pixels should look like based on lighting, texture, and material properties. Path tracing, often used interchangeably with the term ray tracing, even though they aren't exactly the same thing, simulates the path of light rays as they travel through a scene, hitting objects, bouncing, reflecting, refracting, or being absorbed based on a material's properties. 
There are numerous methods that impact the accuracy of the simulation. Recursive ray tracing, for instance, has shadow rays that are sent out at each ray intersection point towards light sources. And photon mapping emits light particles from the light sources of a scene in a preliminary rendering pass. But the principle of both ray tracing and path tracing remains the same. Simulate light by tracing the paths of rays through a scene. How many rays, you ask? Well, that depends. But the short answer is, if you want to do it right, a lot. And when you do it right, it offers a big advantage in terms of realism, especially in scenes with dynamic lighting, like open worlds with day and night cycles. As for why we're doing it now, well, it was inevitable. The industry has wanted to for a long time and for good reasons. Don't take my word for it or Nvidia's, but Pixar describes it as conceptually and mathematically simple and elegant. That means that not only does ray tracing code take up much less storage than the large light maps we need for pre-baked lighting, but no longer making those light maps or adding extra lights to simulate indirect lighting should both save developers time and in result, make for prettier games. That was one of the key sales pitches for ray tracing, that the reduction in man hours outweighs the increased hardware costs. The only problem is that in the context of gaming, the increased hardware cost falls on the gamers, whose GPUs now need to perform those lighting simulations continuously every time they play a game. Power bill? What power bill? And there are other costs. Nvidia has taken a lot of our money during RTX's awkward adolescence, and maybe more importantly, there's a cost in performance. The most expensive gaming GPU, at least until you can get its replacement over here, is the RTX 4090. It has over three times the ray tracing prowess of the underwhelming first generation RTX cards and still can't consistently render a native 4K60 path traced experience. Even the newly announced $2,000 RTX 5090 is advertised to only hit 28 frames per second natively in Cyberpunk with all the ray traced bells and whistles. AI assisted upscaling with DLSS is meant to make up for that. And if my lovely assistant will move, oh, yeah. You can see, clearly it can deliver impressive results, but from talking to one of Ploof's old games industry contacts, gamers aren't the only ones feeling like this transition might have been rushed a little bit. See, the pitch to developers, including to our contact, was of course time savings. But the time that they saved from less manual lighting work ended up getting replaced with more time testing and optimizing performance on those underwhelming early generation cards. Optimization that usually resulted in turning down visual settings, which in many cases left us with image quality that didn't look that much better than traditional rasterization. As Hardware Unbox pointed out in an excellent recent deep dive, those compromises caused some glaring issues, such as noise and artifacting, appearing as a, a boiling effect. Those can be caused by low ray counts, needing to accumulate lighting information over multiple frames, and suboptimal denoising techniques. If you haven't experienced ray tracing at home, it can be hard to tell sometimes. YouTube compression and screenshots will cover a lot of those sins. Furthermore, devs are still learning how to implement ray tracing, both technically and artistically, and the available tools are more rudimentary than their rasterized equivalent. For example, our contact said that key features such as light linking, where lights will affect certain objects and not others, are not as simple to use in ray traced scenes. Some of you might be old enough to remember the era of Bloom video game graphics, where every surface was slathered in a soft, fuzzy glow that made it look like you were playing the game in a foggy mirror. Games like Burnout Paradise, Twilight Princess, and Oblivion come to mind, and just as Bloom, and motion blur, and depth of field and other visual tricks, went from flashy and new to overused and disgusting to intelligently applied, I think ray tracing will hit those same milestones in due time. Strangely enough, the strongest use case today for ray tracing, in our opinion, is the dazzling effect it can have when implemented into older titles, either through discrete remasters, custom mods, or RTX Remix. Nvidia's suite of modding tools designed to make transformative upgrades of old PC games super easy. I recently played through the original Fear with added ray tracing via reshade, and it was nigh transformative even though it pushed a 20 year old game back to sub 60 FPS performance. Part of that performance hit is the hybrid raster and ray trace rendering. Committing to full ray tracing can actually improve performance, like we've seen in Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition or Indiana Jones. So once ray tracing tech has evolved to the point where most games fully transition to ray trace rendering, we may experience a bump in overall playability and maybe, just maybe, GPU makers can reduce the die space used for raster performance in exchange for even more ray tracing prowess, or dare I say, cost savings? Gosh, that would be real nice. 
The worst part of all this is that until we fully solve the chicken egg problem, these issues will linger. And the transition is clearly going to take some time. I mean, nearly one in every 30 PC gamers is still running a 1060 for gosh sake. That came out in 2016. So I don't blame you guys for asking. Yeah, it's pretty, but is ray tracing even worth it? Worth it? Like our new, more compact commuter backpack at ltcstore.com? Okay, jokes aside, only you can answer that question. But what I can say is that no matter who you are, you've got your head in the sand if you think that ray tracing isn't happening and that you won't need it at some point. I mean, I remember back when people thought that fancy mesh shaders were just a ploy to sell new graphics cards. But I think in hindsight, most people would agree now that we're better off for their widespread implementation. I mean, Alan Wake 2 looks incredible and runs well on lower end hardware, as long as it's somewhat recent and has an up-to-date feature set. But these things take time. And I can hear a lot of you saying, well, yeah, sure, it's cool, but I'm going to wait till it can be done natively with real frames, no AI. But I think it's becoming clear that that's not happening. The real solutions are going to come in the form of optimizations, like improvements to proprietary solutions like DLSS ray reconstruction, or generalized shortcuts like better distribution ray tracing. Because the thing is, even in offline CG rendering, studios are still using optimized shortcuts instead of brute forcing more rays. And that's when we're talking about sometimes 24 plus hour render times for a single frame. So if you want your game to hit 60 plus frames per second, you're gonna have to accept that some corners are going to be cut to bring the time down um, 5.2 million times. Really, I don't think the problem is real-time ray tracing itself or even the AI upscaling techniques, but rather that we've been forced to live through and pay for their infancy. Once we've worked through the current shortcomings, we could see ray traced motion blur and depth of field that can push cinematic realism to a whole other level or hardware level support for advanced features like bi-directional path tracing to reduce noise at an equal render time, and maybe even the promise of easier developer side implementation actually coming true. So instead of seeing the new Indiana Jones as the harbinger of GPU pain and suffering, I'm choosing to see it kind of like the hint of a whisper of a twinkle of a bright light at the end of a very expensive, albeit beautifully lit tunnel. Speaking of the light, I can see it. No, wait, that's just a segue to our sponsor. Server part deals. Enterprise drives can be expensive, and when you're trying to buy multiple at a time, <laughs> that cost, well, multiplies. It's a good thing the folks at Server Part Deals are there to help. They sell recertified, refurbished, and even brand new hard drives, stocking options from go-to brands like Western Digital, Seagate, Toshiba, and more. If that's not enough peace of mind, their customer service is all in-house and reachable via email, live chat, and phone. So don't wait. Head over to serverpartdeals.com slash LTT today, and you can get your new drives delivered straight to your door with free two-day US shipping. And guess what? You can save even more with code LTT5OFF to get $5 off any order. We'll have all that information down below. If you're still on the fence about ray tracing, you should probably watch the video where we have people blindly test RTX on and off to see if they can even tell the difference. The results may surprise you.